But first, the iconic figure of Michael Collins, a man who knew the power of his own persona and capitalised on what people wanted to believe about him. The question of who he really was, of course, continues to fascinate people and perhaps to elude them as well. But uh, for my first guest this evening, the willingness to see him as the sum of the Irish Revolution and in turn reduce him to a caricature of his many parts clouds our view of both the man and the revolution. I'm joined in studio by Dr. Anne Dolan of Trinity College Dublin and Dr. William Murphy of Dublin City University. And together they're the authors of a, a wonderful, beautiful new book, Michael Collins, The Man and the Revolution. You're both very, very welcome indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, just first of all, Anne, to get clear, this is not a straightforward biography of Michael Collins. I mean, when you go to page one, he's not in the cradle. Let's no, put it that way. No, no, he isn't. I mean, I think there's been plenty of those ones to date. Mm. And in some ways, I think that familiarity of that type of biography led us to, to try and approach it in a very different way. I mean, we didn't want to offer a single interpretation either. I think we were, I think many of the existing biographies try and figure them out. I mean, Peter Hart's one, which is really excellent in many ways. I mean, even the fact it's called The Real Mick was was moving towards this idea, we'll find out who the, the real Mick was. And in some ways, I think we didn't want to solve him like a puzzle or, or take that type of definitive approach because I think so much of what's interesting about him are the myths and the, mm. if you like, the things people want to make him into. And I think for those reasons, we, we kind of went for a thematic approach, which I think still leaves people room and, and allows the reader to still ask questions at the end of it. And OK, we were looking at familiar themes, like the sort of his, his role in the War of Independence, his, his, you know, his work as a politician. But we're, we're also sort of moving towards things that maybe are less familiar to try and prompt those new questions. So things like Collins and what he believed in, his part, his his Collins and celebrity, those types of things. Mm. And that, I think as well, the other thing that was I think we were really keen to include was, I suppose, a focus on the early part of his life, which in many ways often just gets mined in order to explain why he becomes the man he becomes. And, and actually there's far more interesting things to be, to be got from that period, not least, I suppose, the type of influences and experience he went through in London. Yeah, London is, is, is it's crucial. In absolutely. All. We'll come it's back and we'll effect on him, talk, yeah. talk about, uh, about London. Yeah. But I, I, mean, I would have thought that no two people would ever agree on Michael Collins. Now you have two people, <laughs> therefore, uh, who are involved in writing a book on yeah. Michael Collins. Did you agree on everything, William? <laughs> Oh, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, well, do we agree on everything? Um, I suppose we didn't necessarily have to agree on everything, uh, given that one of the things we were interested in doing is presenting multiple versions of him and engaging with different aspects of his career. Uh, and when we set out to write the book, we had to, well, we had to ask ourselves the question, was it worth writing in the first place, given how many Michael Collins mm. biographies there are? And we sat down and we, we chose the themes in part uh, because they reflected the new material available in part um, because they allowed us to reflect on some of these the new literature that's come out over recent years about the Irish Revolution and put Collins in the context of those but also they reflect our collective and separate interest I suppose mm -hmm. so I, I have worked a lot on imprisonment and you know organisation revolutionary organisation on the relationship between sport and uh, the revolution, for instance, whereas Anne had strengths in areas like violence and the revolution and commemoration and the revolution. So we could, you know, give each other a little bit of space, mm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, mm. to, to, to be the, the, the key voice in the areas where we felt we had the, the greatest So you strength. could sound each other out, but not necessarily, Absolutely. you know, yeah. you still yeah. could yeah. adopt yeah. your own your own particular uh, viewpoint or, or perspective. Um, and come back to London and the influence of uh, the period that he spent in London. I mean, he didn't have a very long life. No, so no. I suppose, no, no. you know, in the context of that life, he would have spent yeah. a long time in oh, yeah. London, but yeah. in absolute terms, not very long at all. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, it, it's really interesting because it's a very important time of any young person's life. It's the, the point in which they're starting to, and particularly someone who goes from a small place to this really exciting, very large city and, on, and very exciting things are happening all around them. And I think one of the things that we benefit from in the book, and I mean, you can see it, we've nearly 200 documents and photographs and all the rest of it, but he's someone who's in London at a time when, you know, the moving image is becoming important. Photography in newspapers is becoming important. And you can see him engaging at that time, even I think in notes he's writing on the, the back of, of minutes he's, he has for his GAA club in London, where he's very aware of what's going on in Finland. And he's thinking about the, the wider world. He's thinking about new ideas. And he's, he's, he's being influenced by those, I think, in, in his thinking. And you can see that emerge in later life. But it's just it's an exciting place for a young and, man and to be. He was also there when the suffrage movement was mm -hmm. in its pomp. What would his, his attitude have been 
towards that? Because one of the great imponderables is, would things have been different for women in Ireland in the 1920s had Michael Collins survived? Yeah, uh, I mean, look, uh, there's no doubt uh, that uh, he's in he's in favour of the vote for women, but his attitude towards women in terms of their role in public life seems to be quite limited. If you look at the people who he engaged with and who he trusts, and if he's got a political problem to work out, or if he's got uh, you know if he's facing an issue, it's it's men who are around him. It's men he trusts. That that being said, he unless worked... unless he's got a message that needs to be conveyed from point A <laughs> yes, to point B, yeah, yeah, then yeah. he's utterly reliant on yeah, women. Yeah, he, he works. He works. Women work for him, I think, mm. rather than him but treating them him. as then with him. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, women admire him greatly, uh, mm-hmm. and those who work with him are extremely loyal to him. Uh, so, for instance, um, one of the documents, which is one of my favourites in the book, is a, a letter from uh, Mary Molly Woods in 1937. This is about the bicycle. This is about the bicycle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Explain that. Well, in in 1937, she wrote to Pierce Beasley, who was working on another edition of his biography of Collins at the time, and she informs him that back in 1920 or 21 uh, Michael had needed to change the saddle on his bicycle and uh, she had decided to keep the saddle of the bicycle and she had retained it all these years and now she was considering whether the National Museum was the most appropriate place to send it. Sounds like Flann O'Brien would have been the most appropriate person <laughs> to send it to, the, you know, the, the third policeman. But it's interesting, it shows, you know, it, sh- it shows how she regarded Collins, that even this small thing, his, you know, his bicycle saddle, was Mm -hmm. not just worthy of her keeping, but she thought it was worthy of a place in the National Museum. Because the great backside had sat (laughs) upon said (laughs) said, said saddle. Um, Now, he was a minor figure in 1916, and and he kind of, he goes from naught to 60 in a very short period of time. So, uh, I mean, to what extent was his involvement in 1916 part and parcel of that? I mean, it is part and parcel of it, and in a way, he's it, you know he's established. He's there as aide de camp to Joseph Plunkett. He's you know he's he gets sent off to Frongok. In a way, he establishes. He he acquires the if you like the experience of the rising that becomes incre- in, incredibly important. I think in a way, it's it's when he gets back, and and I mean it, it's it's those linkages with the prisoners. It's the linkages thereafter with the volunteers on the outside. It's particularly, I think, it's it's the importance of him becoming involved in the Irish National Aid and Volunteers Dependence Fund. But uh, come, go back to Frongok because yeah. uh, he would not, I would have thought, he wouldn't have been by any manner of means the most senior no. volunteer in Frongok. Yet he comes across as the kind of vice chancellor of Old Skull yeah, yeah. in in Frongok. I mean, he more or less he, he appears yeah. to. And it's to to you know take it by the scruff of the neck. I mean, he's very good at, I and mean, this is true of pretty much everything he gets involved in. He's very good at becoming someone who does hard work, takes on jobs that other people don't want to do. He's quite good at imposing himself on on other people. I think there's there's probably he's one of those people who thinks that there's no job he couldn't do better himself. And in a way, he becomes a quite you know enforceful kind of figure in Frongok. Often, I think there he, he he gets enemies as well as friends because of of that nature of his of his of his personality maybe he's, he's someone who can rub people up the mm. wrong way and mm. that becomes clear from frongok onwards but at the same time what also becomes clear from that point is just his willingness to take on just jobs that other people don't want to do and is it in frongok that the organizational skills uh, come to the come to the fore yeah, I, I mean, they certainly do uh, in Frongoch. Um, very early on, when he moves to London, for instance, you can see his aptitude for taking on administrative jobs and trying to control an organisation when he joins, for instance, the Geraldine's GAA Club very early in London. And he immediately becomes, well, almost immediately becomes the secretary of that club. And there, you know, uh, that's the, the position. Anyone who knows the GAA Club knows the secretary is the position where the real power lies. It's where you can network out of. It's You have to do all the nasty work, but at the same time, all the influence and power accumulates there. And inside Frongoch, again, uh, he begins to do that. He becomes secretary to the prisoners inside uh, Frongoch in the, in the later period uh, in, the, in the camp, uh, particularly when conflict is emerging between mm. the prisoners and the authorities. Uh, and he embraces that conflict uh, with great gusto, uh, partly because... Uh, he thinks that's what should be done, but partly because the conflict is around conscription and the threat of conscription inside the camp, where, strange as it may seem, the British authorities thought it might be a good idea to construct 
conscript some of these Irish rebels out into the British army. The British authorities do have some strange ideas, <laughs> don't they? Uh, and Collins was one of the people who would have been liable to that because he had lived in London mm. for, for so long, right up to yeah. the introduction of conscription. And then when he comes out and he becomes Secretary of the Irish National Aid and Association Volunteer Dependence Fund, he's building networks with uh, prisoners, he's building networks between prisoners, he's building networks out to the committees all around the country who are raising the funds and distributing the funds and as soon as he has those networks in place he's then beginning to utilise them for his other purposes. So himself and Michael Staines will try and use those branches to become the basis of the organisation of either Irish volunteer branches or Sinn Féin branches. He's constantly double and triple jobbing mm. to try and make maximise both his influence and the resources he has created. William said that he embraced conflict and what about uh, mm. his embrace of violence? I mean he's someone who's in some ways you could argue he's quite pragmatic about it. He, he you know certainly he's he's famously have known to have said that you know we won't have another Greek tragedy like the the Easter Rising and and I mean I, there's a number of ways you could read that but he's someone who's quite prepared to get rid of awkward people and that's something we see through the War of Independence. I mean how much he's actually in control of the types of violence that go on then throughout the War of Ind- Independence is quest- we could question that certainly how much control he has over what's happening in other counties outside of Dublin it's very 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 hard to, to know and I think he admits that at various different times. I mean, he, but- he supports Dan Breen and Sean Tracy mm-hmm. the, their action mm-hmm. in Solihead Beg in January 1919 which I imagine must have been a great shock to a lot of people including yeah. people in the volunteer yeah. movement Yes, yeah but I think at the same time he's also aware of how much can they actually achieve at any given time and I think one of the things he is I suppose kind of, it becomes clear within some of his letters uh, right across the War of Independence period he often sees violence as a way to draw more violence back on if you like the Irish volunteers almost as a way to create a sense of greater sympathy, if you like, uh, for the for the, the retaliation, if you like, mm. you know, in response to the retaliation, if that makes sense. Um, that he sees, he's, he, in, and in that sense, he's very pragmatic about this because in a way he's, he's trying to keep, he's trying to keep, keep people with this movement, if you like. You can't alienate people too much. So there's all this time. And again, it's, it's all, again, back to how aware he was of propaganda, how wary he is of the media and how the media is li- liable to respond to various different acts. And you, you see this in some of the notes he writes at various different times that, you know, certain thing has happened and he says, oh, well, we're in for we're in for a real crucifixion now, almost looking forward to it because in a way that will then gain more public sympathy for the Irish case. You must have figured that you weren't going to get out of the studio without being asked the old chess note and I'm going to pass it over to a <laughs> member of the public, one of our listeners, uh, so that uh, so Ray and Kilkenny gets to ask the question... <laughs> Uh, rather than me, was it ever known or discovered who shot Michael Collins nearly a hundred years after his death? <laughs> uh, you know, I, and maybe you well, want to talk about that. I mean, there are, I think, over recent years, and I think certainly from a, a number of the, the previous biographies, I think settled on Sonny O'Neill. I mm. mean, I think there's another recent book t- uh, has come out raising questions about that again. I think, in some ways. The fact that he's dead is the key thing. The, the ambush, in a way, and, and, and all this curiosity about how he died uh, maybe speaks to just the, the, the type of need we have for him to have died in a more spectacular way than he did. Because he was the only casualty. Yes, <laughs> yeah, had died, yeah. I mean, I think there's a, a, a slight injury to, 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 to one other person, but I mean, I think it even came up in, if you, if you look at Neil Jordan's film diary, he, t- he talks about how worried Liam Neeson was that, that Collins dies in just, in just this very straightforward, very mm. sort of almost far banal. Too banal way and, yeah. and how, will, how are we going to prepare a, a cinema audience for this and I think in a way that, that is almost symbolic of the, that same urgency to, to make his death much more exciting and, and even conspiratorial than, than it was the, and, and which I think says a lot about But Eamon de Valera was nowhere near it in, <laughs> no. case, in case you're wondering <laughs> um, near, yeah. the, uh, the, the one of his personas obviously Will mm. is the the intelligence chief mm. you know he was minister for finance but he's better known as the intelligence chief and it's been said that you know he single-handedly destroyed the British Secret Service in Ireland uh, he, he can't have done that but to what extent uh, is it even vaguely true um, look it, there's no doubt that he has a role um, in terms of the formation of the squad there's no doubt he has a role when the Dublin Brigade are starting to uh, first attack 
attacked the intelligence capacity of the Dublin Metropolitan Police in the summer of 1919 and again later on in the intelligence war more generally against the British. Um, But he does that in connection with a whole series of other people, uh, Mulcahy, uh, Tobin, Thornton, who are all in many ways uh, more involved, I think, in the day-to-day decisions Mm. and the actual shooting than than Collins is. I mean, Collins is involved in very, very little shooting himself. Um, You know, and Part of that is, you know, these multiple roles again, uh, obviously right through 1919, 1920, 1921, when a lot, uh, particularly in 2021, when that violence is happening. Uh, Collins is Minister for Finance. Uh, he's managing the Daw loan, which is extremely important. Uh, important because it allows the creation of this counter finances the creation of this counter state yes uh, uh, the Sinn Féin courts the and Sinn the local Féin, government e- exactly. and all of this and of course it finances the guns with which these yes. people are being killed which is crucial uh, mm. um, which is very important um, but he's uh, he's he's very clever again here as minister for, uh, as minister for finance in terms of the Dáil loan in terms of how projecting himself in, in a modern way. There's a very interesting uh, film which was made to promote the Dáil loan, mm. and he is sitting uh, handing out bonds, uh, taking the checks, um, and it's uh, and the film says that he's doing this uh, on the table, which is uh, uh, where the uh, be- beheading had taken uh, place of one of the great Irish patriots, and he's. He's harking back to this ancient patriotism, but also there's this modern, efficient bureaucracy going mm. on, and also he's using modern technology to pr- to promote the, the the movement. This is the film that's taken round to cinemas around the country by the IRA, and it's suggested to the cinema owners that they might want to play this uh, film mm. or else. Yes, absolutely, and, and then crucially, you're binding in the fourth element again, the violence there. So mm. you know, it's efficient organisation, it's politics, it's modern, but it's also there's threat there too. Yeah, mm-hmm. but uh, as a bureaucrat, I mean. He was a politician and he was Minister for Finance. Was he a good bureaucrat, Anne? Yes, I mean, he's, he, again, he's, he's pretty capable in a number of these different roles, not least, and again, I think we see it in a lot of the documents we've, we've reproduced in the book. He's constantly churning out paper and, and lots of us constantly churn out paper, not to, to any great end, but he's in, in pretty considerable control of this paper as well. I mean, it's, it's the notion of the, even the attempts at, at the types of bookkeeping he's trying to, to, to achieve through this period is, is quite striking in a way, given how underground it is, given the, the kind of danger that many of them are in at the time. And in, in many respects, I think you sometimes see there's a, a, a piece in one of Ernie O'Malley's um, memoirs where he talks about meeting Collins um, and coming up to see him. And in, throughout the entire time he speaks to Collins, Collins never stops writing mm. and never stops sort of signing letters and, and doing Nowadays things. Nowadays he'd be texting or something. Yeah, possibly, like yes, yes. Yeah. So he's clearly someone who's, who's very, very capable of mm. conducting a conversation but continuing to, to do this at the same time. But, I mean, he's equally capable. So unlike most men, he can multitask. Absolutely, yeah. yes, yes, of course. Um, but yeah. I think there's one piece we have in the, in, in the, in, in the book, um, it's just this, this note, which it's, it's unclear who he sends it to, but he just writes, I told you so, Michal. And in a way, you know, he's, he can be a very good administrator but equally there's that instinct in him which feels that you know he needs to send someone a letter like that which is going to produce you would imagine a pretty negative effect one of the great things about the book is big there are fabulous photographs and um you know michael collins of the war of independence is uh, stereotypically the man on the bicycle wearing a suit with a hat and a coat and uh, you know trying to look as ordinary as possible then comes the civil war now he's the man in the uniform but he was never really a soldier, was he? Uh, no, he was. Uh, and this emerges very clearly during the, the treaty debates, where this is a, an accusation thrown at him by many of those who uh, are opposing the treaty uh, and are accusing him of being a sellout. And they're saying, you have been represented as the man who won the war. There's this, really, you are a myth uh, um, you know, you're, you're you're pretending to be a soldier now. You've pretended to be a soldier all along, but really, it was people like us in Tipperary and, and in Cork who did the hard work, who uh, who you know who won this war. Uh, uh, and there's a real sense for some of them uh, that that Collins, the soldier, is is a charlatan. But he can't time, bring he can't bring them with him because I think about two thirds of the of the volunteers go anti-treaty. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that said, uh, one of the 
organisations where he can clearly wield a lot of influence is the Irish Republican Brotherhood. Yes. And he is very successful in bringing large swathes of the Irish Republican Brotherhood with him. Mm. And these are people who are apparently the most ideological Republicans inside the movement. And yes, they're prepared, yet they're prepared to co- follow Collins uh, and support the treaty. And again, in part, that I think reflects how quite how good a politician he is in the committee room. Uh, as the negotiations are going on towards the treaty, he is constantly preparing the IRB for the compromise which is to come. So that when it co- when it arrives, they're ready for it and, and they're willing to accept it. Whereas I think you have a problem in Ireland at that stage where there were large swathes of the country who hadn't been prepared for the yeah. compromise which was mm. to follow. Um, f- finally, Anne, the, 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 was he conscious of his own image? Was he conscious of his own iconic yes. status and did he promote that? He's very conscious of it. I mean, at one point he writes to De Valera and says to him, you know, I hope you read about that escape I had last week. It's nothing on the one I had the week before. And he's very, very conscious of of, of the press coverage and even and particularly the, some of the British press coverage. And in ways it's it's no harm, I think, for him that he is being perceived in that particular way and he, he uses that image to his advantage. Even when he goes to London, he, he stays a day behind the the rest of the delegation. And you can see even the response if you look at the British press that they, they they're the one, he's the one they're waiting to see and, and this but is, is he conscious that the Irish people really at this stage need some kind of a Superman type figure um, in terms of morale yeah. I think he he does because there's a number of his own I mean there's a number of volunteers write to him at, at various different stages saying you know if your cot were lost you're the only one who matters he's getting these kind of letters even when he's over in London he's sending home death threats and saying to sort of Desmond Fitzgerald at home get those put in the paper I think he knows exactly what he's what his his value is in that way and you know he even talks about some of the the more the more sort of outrageous stories that are in the British press about him so he's he's keeping an eye on on what the popular British press are saying about him all the way long which again may Maybe it gets us back to where we started. He's very conscious of what that, how that press works from his time in London. He knows exactly how to use his own persona and to use it very carefully. William Murphy and Dolan, thank you both very much indeed for joining us. The book is called Michael Collins, The Man and the Revolution. Beautifully illustrated uh, hardback book by, appropriately enough, I suppose, the Collins uh, Press. Thank you very much again uh, for joining us.